Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be here? Yes. We're going to be looking at our portion, Kitavo, on a message called Influential Blessings. And we are looking at a portion right before the last one of the year, before the Jewish New Year. So we're really grateful to be able to get into this message and to be able to uh, really prepare our hearts for what's coming. Because Rosh Hashanah is around the corner. It's next Sunday. Go ahead, give it up for the Lord. And is Rosh Hashanah coming? That is the Feast of Trumpets known as Yom Teruah. And it is a sound of the shofar blast that starts the civil calendar or New Year on the uh, the... Jewish calendar, which is not the same as the counting of months, because it's actually the seventh month, first day of the seventh month, versus Passover's month of uh, Aviv, or now as we know it as Nisan, that is for counting months, and that is a new year spiritually for Israel coming out of Egypt. So we're going to get into the message today. Um, can you say influential blessings? Influential and uh, we know the Torah portion comes from Devarim or Deuteronomy 26, 1. Uh, through 29.8 and uh, the prophet reading is Yeshayahu which is Isaiah 60 1 through 22 what a great read that was right yeah, and Acts 7 30 through 36 was also a great new covenant read we want to say a hearty bruchim habayim or welcome to all of our first time guests anybody here for the first time God will be here for the first time. And all returning family members, glad for you to be back. Mishpoka, a uh, Hebrew word for family or mishpacha. So we're glad you came back. And wouldn't it be great if we all celebrate the feast right there at the, at the temple? Yeah. But not at the Kotel, like in the temple area, right? That's right? Wouldn't that be great if we had the temple today? Let's get ready for 10 minutes of Torah as we get into our Mosaic instruction. You excited today? Yeah. I'm going to be reading there six days of morning manna. Yep. All right, so you should be ready to go today. Complete Jewish Bible reads out of Deuteronomy 26.1. It says, When you have come to the land, or the term is Kitavo, the name of our portion, when you come to the land, Adonai your God has given you as an inheritance, take in possession of it and settle there. You shall take the first fruits of all the crops. The first fruits are known as Bikurim. Uh, the first fruits of all your crops, and it says, from the ground, or what the ground yields, which you will harvest. Can you say harvest? harvest? So you got first fruits, and you got harvest. From your land that Adonai your God is giving you, put them in a basket and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. God told Solomon, not David, but Solomon, the son of David, who wanted to build God's, uh, God a house, he says, you're going to declare my name in a place where my eyes, my ears, my heart will be there forever. How I many know God's eyes, his heart, his ears, his name is there in Jerusalem forever? Uh, and uh, we know that God hears the prayers in that place. But two words that stand out are first fruits and harvest. Because out of your harvest, you're to give God first fruits. Now, I know it's a little confusing in a, in a world where we don't have the temple to understand the difference between tithes and offerings and first fruits. But in the midst of a harvest cycle, they would make sure that the first fruits of the crop would actually be brought first, and they would tie that bushel or tie that amount, sometimes even with a red cord tied around, like the, the, the red string around uh, the hand of, who was it, Perez, or was it uh, the other child that came out of uh, Tamar and Judah? Zerah. 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 So that was the first one. That's the one that got the, the red string. But you would basically declare who is the firstborn, just like you would declare what is the first fruit. And this is what's going to set Israel up for a unique potential, and that is to have influence in the world. Because we see that influence is the name of our portion, and influence can be defined as. Let's change it. Influence can be defined as the capacity to have an effort on, or excuse me, an effort, uh, the capacity to have an effect, takes effort, but an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. How many want influence in your life? Yeah. One of the definitions of leadership is influence, because you can't lead people that you can't influence. So influence is important. It's the capacity to have an effect on character, 
development or behavior of something or literally someone or something. And that's what influence is. Let's see how God sets Israel up for influence if they were to bring God the first fruits. He tells them in verse number 3, he says, You will approach the Kohen, the priest, holding office at that time, and say to him, Today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land Adonai, the Lord, swore to our ancestors, our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give us, the Kohen, the priest, will take the basket from your hand, put it down in front of the altar of Adonai, your God. Then in the presence of Adonai, your God, you are to say, my ancestor, my forefather, was a nomad from where? Aram. Notice from Aram, not a necessary an Aramean by blood, a Hebrew by blood, but from Aram. Uh, interesting that we get the word Aramaic from this ancient word Aram, which is the name of one of the descendants of Noah. So just before the Tower of Babel, you had uh, basically Eber, where we get the word Hebrew from, and you have Aram, where you get Aramaic. So these ancient languages go all the way back to Genesis and since the Tower of Babel. And it says, he went down into where? Egypt. Egypt few in number and stay there. So who actually is this person referring to when they bring the first fruits? Who's the one that went to Egypt? Who went to e Egypt? Jacob, with his 70, went into Egypt, Exodus chapter 1, right? From 12 sons, Jacob goes in to Egypt. Now obviously we know Joseph ended up there first by one of or the 12, or at least the 11 brothers, maybe just 10 of them. Benjamin kind of didn't have anything to do with that. He wasn't even uh, able to, to, to play a part in that. But we see that he went down to Egypt, few in number, and stayed there. There he became a great, strong, populous nation. Notice God declares they were big and strong, even when seemingly they were weak. Yeah. Small in number, but there in Egypt they grew. How many do we estimate came out of Egypt at Passover? Two million plus. Some estimate even three million. How did they get that number? The Bible specifically says 600 enlisted men in the army. Six, excuse me, 600,000 enlisted men in the army. And if you have women and children, on average, you're looking at least two million people. And it tells you in the text, there he became what? Great, strong, and populous nation. Not when they came out, when they went in. You don't get strong when you come out of battle. You get strong when you go in a battle. Because if you didn't have a battle, you would never know what your potential capacity is. And influence is having capacity to make an effect on behavior, what else? On, on character, on even the development of something. So Israel was given this ability to show their strength in the midst of weakness. To show deliverance in the midst of slavery. God always reveals his strength in the midst of weakness. If you were never sick, you would never know God was a healer. If you were never lost, you'd never know him as someone who could find you and save you. And if you were never in bondage, how could he redeem you and bring you out of bondage? Pray the, pay the price. So, we take a look at... Um, verse 16 and it says today Adonai your God orders you to obey these laws and rulings now uh, notice that it says with all your heart with all your being or soul you are agreeing today you are agreeing today you are agreeing today not I'm making you God never makes you keep his commandments you agree to keep them Amen. I can't hear you Amen. you agree to keep them to follow in his ways, observe his laws, mitzvot, which are commandments and rulings, and do what he says. Now, notice what verse 18 says. In turn, here we go. In turn, it says, Adonai is agreeing today that you are his what? Unique, Unique treasure. Am segula, a peculiar treasure. As he promised you, and that you are to observe all his mitzvot, and that he will raise you high above all nations he has made in praise, reputation, glory, and that he said you will be a holy people for Adonai, your God. 
Look what a commentator by the name of Gil says about this. He says, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. <laughs> Affirmed and declared them to be his special people above all people on the face of the earth, and that they were looked upon and considered by him as his what? Jewels. Jewels. His peculiar treasure, as he hath promised thee, on condition of their obedience to him, as he did in Exodus 19.5. We know that's where we get the whole concept of where 1 Peter 2.9 says, You're a holy nation, peculiar people, right? Show forth the praise of him who is called you out of darkness. We're a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. That comes from Exodus chapter 19, right before they giving the Ten Commandments. If we jump ahead to chapter 28, verse 1, it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey. Remember, it's all based on obedience. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his what? Amen. Commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations. He will set you low? High. high. Well, what if you're in Egypt? And that's low land. Just know if you get in low land, God's desire is to set you on high. So he's got to bring you out of the lowland of Egypt and bring you up to the mountain of the Lord. Amen. Sinai. Because his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He's got to set you on high. He's the most high, but he also seats you with him to be on high. He says, high above all nations. Notice that Israel would be above all the nations. Because you can't be a light to people when you're on the same level. Amen. You can't be a light to a person if you're doing exactly what they do in darkness. If Moses is in the mountain and Israel's worshiping a golden calf, how many know they cannot be a light to the nations worshiping a golden calf? But when they obey the Torah and not have any graven images before them, now we can show all the pagan idol worshipers, this is how we do it. We don't worship idols that we make with our hands or things that are formed because we don't look at God through form, we look at it through function. His eyes speak of wisdom, right? His mouth speaks of his words speaking and penetrating our life through prayer and through the study of his Torah. His ears are open to our prayers to hear. His hands refer to his power. With an outstretched arm, he redeemed us. He doesn't have hands and eyes and feet like you and I have. But there are metaphors for his omniscience and his omnipotence, right? His omnipresence. He's everywhere. Even when God sits in a throne, it's not typically a throne. It just means, you ever notice that God's throne has wheels on it? <laughs> wheel in the middle of a wheel that's like that's like a, a, a wheel that moves on a ball level it's like you know rolling chairs a wheel in the middle of a wheel that's like it rolls on all sides God has a really cool chair I can't wait to see that one. <laughs> it just means he can go anywhere it's almost like God has an electronic chair it really does. that's what it's going to mean I mean he can zoom here and zoom there he's everywhere at all times he's omnipotent and he's omniscient and he's omnipresent amen, amen. amen. now I want to show you something that it says in verse 2. It says, all these blessings shall come upon who? Yes. You. Come upon it. who? Yes. And it won't just come upon you. It will overtake you because you obey the voice of God. Here are the blessings that God pronounces over you when you obey him. Number one, he will bless you in the city in your local influence. People that are your neighbors, fellows in business, merchants that you deal with, people that you do contracts with, they should see the blessing of God in your life locally. And if you're blessed in the city, your local influence is there. If he blesses you in the country, now we go a little further. We go into national and global influence because from country side to country, we go out of the city into the country, we're traveling, we should have national and global influence if we start with local influence. Meaning start with your Jerusalem, then your Judea, then your Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen? Amen? Blessed in the fruit of your body. That's a legacy of successors. Now, most of the time it's referred to your children. Abraham had only Eliezer. He would have to give all his possession to Eliezer had he not had who? Isaac. And Isaac had? Jacob. Not the Ishmaels and the Esau's, but the Isaacs and the Jacob's. So there has to be a legacy of successors. That also goes for people that have spiritual sons and daughters. You can have a spiritual legacy that you pass on. The fruit of your body is... Speaking of children, I'm still believing God for a boy. And uh, his name will be Giovanni Israel, I prophesy. Uh, I can't make the child come, but Lord, you can. And uh, a little girl, seven years old, I, she needs a brother. 
She's actually looking for twins, like a boy and a girl. She's like against the duel, so who knows? Uh, look what it says in, in the number four. Bless in the produce of your ground. This speaks of fruitfulness in finances. Because the produce of your ground, when they would take the produce from the ground, they could sell it in the marketplace. That was their fruitfulness in their finances. Blessed in the increase of their livestock. Now, if you had a lot of camel, you had a lot of oxen, you were really wealthy. That's like having stocks and bonds. It's like having you know, big, heavy animals or heavy uh, accounts filled with money. It refers to the increase in wealth because the more animals you had that could harvest, could grow, could plow the field, you obviously had more wealth, and Abraham was very wealthy. Number six, in the daily bread and storehouse, not only in your kneading bowl, but even in your storehouses with grain. This speaks of abundant provision and resources. So not only for you, but to give out to the poor, to the widow, and take care of the Levite, right? Yes. Can you believe God for blessings that go beyond you, yes. your city, your country, your descendants, and touches the whole world? Amen. That was Abraham's promise. And the last one, blessed, blessed, in your, uh, blessed in your travel, coming and going. I believe that just covers success in all endeavors. Because in coming and going, we're blessed going in, and we're blessed coming out. Amen? Amen? Israel was blessed to go in, because they multiplied there and came out blessed. Amen? Amen. So the other word I want to look at is obviously in our message. Um, oh, I forgot to give you the first. This was the second definition I had. I didn't give you on that PowerPoint. I think I gave it in your outline, though. Did I give you what the original one was? Yes. Harvest. harvest. What was the definition of harvest? A season, a season of reaping for what has been sown. A season of reaping for what has been sown. That's because I don't have my little outline up here. But the season of reaping of what's been sown. If you've sown, you should expect to what? Reap. 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 And in that reaping, then there is influence. And that influence causes us to uh, have an effect on those around us. Uh, let me close out this uh, thought here today with Deuteronomy 28, 7 that says, The Lord will cause your enemies even who rise against you to be defeated before you, and they shall come out against you one way, and they shall flee how many ways? Seven. Seven. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord God is giving you. Is that good stuff today? Yes. Man, I want to harvest, but I want to be blessed also with influence with that harvest. So God says, start with giving the first fruits. Remember where you came from. You were, you were like Jacob in Egypt, but when you came out, you were strong, you were mighty, you were prosperous. Use that prosperity to influence and bless others. Amen. How many ready for 10 minutes of Haftarah? Prophet reading. Actually, I gleaned a little bit from this one. I only have a couple verses to share with you. And it's right out of our prophet reading, Isaiah 60, verse 1. So I want you to think about what God said. God says, I'll give you influence that you'll be blessed in every area. Starting from the local city to the country, your descendants will be blessed. Your animals will be blessed. Your bread basket will be blessed. Everything you, you do will be blessed. Even what you store up for a rainy day and to bless others will be blessed. And because you're willing to be blessed, to be a blessing like Abraham, I will increase your blessing, meaning I'll give you the blessing for influence. Rich people are not influential because they have a lot of money in the bank. Rich people can only be influential when they do what's right with what's in their bank. And when they use it to bless others instead of hoard it to themselves, they become an influential person. Why? Because people talk about not only the blessing they have, but what they do with it. Why was Abraham influential? Because people would come to his door, a tent door knowing that he was hospitable even when he had just had a circumcision. Read Genesis 18. And so he'd kill the fatty calf. That means he'd bring out the best, like ribeyes for the rabbi. He'd bring him and say, no Taco Bell, come on. <laughs> Burger King, I can't have it my way at Burger King. Uh, you might like Burger King, but that's not the king's meal. Give me a, a fatted calf. That's what the king should have. And especially a prodigal son that's treated like a prince when he comes home, because one day he'll be king. Amen. Woo! So I can't wait to go to lunch with you on a fatted calf diet. <laughs> I love what it says. Arise and shine for your light has come. Think of your light as your influence. Because the nations and the kings will see your light. You will influence them. And Sheba will come. The queen of Sheba saw Solomon's light, his wisdom, his influence. 
his blessing in the world. And she was amazed at his, at his servants, the way they took care of the household. He was influential because of the way he handled his wealth. Now, there was a season of foolishness where he wasn't so influential in a good way. But by the end of his life, he repented, thank God. He said, all is vanity. And he says, I realize the best thing is just to love God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's influence. When we obey him, he blesses us. When we obey him, he gives us influence. He lets our light shine in obscurity and darkness, and people see it. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. So when the rest of the world is dark, you're supposed to shine. Oh, that was good. When the rest of the world is dark, or living in darkness, you're supposed to shine. You do your best in an Egypt when you can trust God to bring you to the promised land. Now, think about this. Why did God not just destroy Israel when they worshiped the golden calf? Because God says, I'm going to use you who's small. I'm going to do great things with you. And he got a leader to be convinced that they were worth it. He even said, I'm going to destroy him. And Moses goes, no, don't do it, because what will the other nations say? What if you treated obedience this way? Well, if I do that, if I walk away from God, what will all my friends and family say that I was trying to win to the Lord? If I go back to darkness, what influence will I have if I stop serving the God who is the God of my salvation? The Lord is my light, my rock, my salvation. If I go back now, how am I going to have influence in the right way with people around me? I need to rise and shine in the midst of the darkness. Remember, we don't curse darkness. We shine the light. Here's one of the passages I gleaned from. It says, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen on you. People will see your glory. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a testimony where I was in a place of worship and I was walking in tired. I had worked all the day before and I was just exhausted. And I remember that that morning I had a time of prayer, but I was really tired. I was crying out to God saying, God, I'm tired. I need refreshing. And this is before I understood the revelation of Shabbat, but I was just tired and exhausted all the time. And I walked into this place of worship and service hadn't started yet and next thing you know, someone came up to me and said, wow, the anointing of the Lord is all over you. And like, brother, you know back in those days, brother, the, the Lord is all over you. I'm like, he is. I said, are you talking about the same person? Is there somebody in back of me you're pointing to? No, there's such an anointing on you. When I opened my Bible, I remember turning to this verse and the Lord spoke to me and said, don't you know when you're weak, that's when I show myself strong? Hallelujah. When you're tired, that's when the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. When you feel like you're surrounded in darkness, that's when the light has the potential to shine the greatest. You can't see the contrast between light and darkness if you didn't have darkness. That's right. And when you turn the light on, when it's been previously dark, the light comes vividly to your eye in a greater capacity than if you were already walking in a lesser light and come to a greater light. When you're in darkness, the light stands out stronger. Yes. It shines in your eyes and other people see it. And it says the Gentiles will come to your light. That sounds like influence to me. If people are coming to me, I must have influence. If people are saying, lead me, teach me, guide me, pray for me. If they're doing it to you, you have influence. If the coworker that's been against you all month or all week or all day comes at the end of that day, that week, that month, and says, you know what, will you pray for me? Me? You mean the other guy? The guy that you haven't said anything negative about? No, no. The very person that came against you is the very person that one day is going to come to you. The very people that try to destroy Israel be the very nations that come are going to worship at his throne. Amen? Amen. 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 Go ahead and give the Lord a hand. He deserves it. He says, the Gentiles, the nations, will come to your light. Now that also shows me the Messianic movement. For Gentiles, ever since the first century, have been coming to the light of Yeshua, which is the light of the Torah, for thousands of years. The only thing is, we forgot Israel was the original light to the nations. And the Messianic movement has restored Israel to their place of being a light to nations. And it says, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Isaiah 60, verse 4. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Who do they come to? 
to you. Your son shall come from afar, meaning all your sons of exile will come home. Your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy because, why? The abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, and the wealth of Gentiles shall come to you. Tell me that's not influence. Not only God blessing what I do, but God blessing other people to now bless me because of what I do. If you do something to bless someone else, someone will get behind you and support it. Trust me. I did it the other day. There was a person, an um, African man, been in America for a while. He was hurting, struggling. I heard about it. The person said, well, there's just this, a need, a financial need. I said, how much? The person said, no, $100. I said, is that all? Just 100 I said, look at this. We can knock that out right now. And before I could pull out my money, which I want to knock out about at least a quarter of that, it was already someone pulling out money out of their purse, another person pulling it out of their, you know, their wallet. Another person said, well, I'll go to the bank on lunch. And in seconds, we had the need met. Amen. Don't tell me that God hasn't blessed you to be a blessing. Yes. But if you're going to be Kovaluro, <laughs> tight elbow where you can't extend, <laughs> why should God bless you if you can't bless others? That's right. But Israel is meant to be a blessing. Now, you ready for some 10 minutes of um, read how to shout? Yes. yes. Got a few minutes left. Let's take a look at the only passage I want to look at today. I want to sh show you how the Apostle Paul, or Rav Shaul, Saul of Tarsus, was a blessing. And how you and I can be a blessing to nations. Because he understood his calling both to Israel and to the nations of the world. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians 9.19 says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. What if we did that? We know we're blessed above. But what if we were still willing to serve somebody else? God bless us here. But we humble ourselves to come down here and be a servant to all. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. That I might win more or win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew. Jew. Now, wait a minute. How can a Jew become more of a Jew than he already is a Jew? Yeah. First of all, you need to understand the word Jew is not referring to Jewish the way we use today. And it's definitely not talking about just from the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes. It's referring to the territory of influence that Judah was given. And so Benjamin, which is the tribe Saul was from, the same as King Saul before King David, he was from Benjamin. And they lived in the territory or region or the influential area of Judah. Judah had influence over Benjamin. So for instance, if you were a Pharisee and you wanted your son to become a Pharisee, you would send him to the best, most influential teacher in Judah or Judea. And that would be in the city of Jerusalem and at the time of Saul, it was Gamaliel, who was the most influential leader of the day. He was taught at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, although he was born in Cilicia, in Tarsus, under Roman province. So he had Roman citizenship, so he had influence in Rome. But because he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, he had influence as a Jew, by a Jew. As a Pharisee, by a Pharisee as a Hebrew, by Hebrews. When a Jew comes back to who they are, oh, that's a whole sermon itself. All of a sudden, the Jew becomes influential because instead of the Jew pretending to not be Jewish, like a lot of American Jews today, they don't want anyone to know they're Jewish because of persecution. When a Jew comes back to not being the token Jew in a congregation, but rises up and say, my job is to teach the Goyim who they're supposed to be and follow. And I'm going to show you the way, the truth, and the life from my Jewish Messiah because of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I have the bloodline of. I'm going to stand up and be who God called me to be. I'm chosen. I'm royal. I'm priestly. I'm called to minister. I'm called to be a blessing. And it's time for Jewish people to rise up and start being the blessing that they've always been called to be. Not just financially, not just intellectually, but spiritually have a greater influence. It's time I'm calling all all American Jews, come back to the feast. Come back to Shabbat. Come back to the synagogue. Come back to the place of worship. Come back to reading the Torah and the prophets. Be the influencers you are meant to be. Trust me. 
There are tons of Gentiles that will come to you and say, what must I do to learn my roots? What must I do to not just know Jesus, but know Yeshua the Messiah? What must I do to get connected to the roots that I shouldn't boast over? Because I should realize I don't support the root, that root supports me. When the Gentile as a wild olive branch gets engrafted in, they realize the influence is not coming from the branch, it's coming from the root. Yeah. Israel's blessed to be a blessing. Why do you think they're the center of prophecy as well as the center of the news today? Because politically, the enemy knows, spiritually the enemy knows, that if he can push Israel into a corner where they don't have influence, and they don't speak up, and they don't stand for what's right, the enemy will walk all over them like they did in Egypt, like they did in Assyria and Babylon, Medes and Persians until Queen Esther. Yay! And Mordecai. Yay! Yay. Yay. Wrong guy. Yeah. And get rid of the Hamans of the world. Yeah. Now you can move. It's time for another one like Judah Maccabees, Yeshua the Messiah, to rise up, the conquering lamb, Amen. and defeat another enemy in a Hanukkah celebration of light. Amen. Now, I have to share this with you. Look what it says. Jews, to the Jews that became Jew. What that meant was, when I was in Judea, I lived like a Judean. Now, I will explain this to you in one specific way. How many have been to Israel? Okay. How many felt, look, keep your hand up if you've uh, been to Israel. You have influence that uh, no one else has. Okay. Been to Israel. If I were to ask you, what's the difference between the influence in Tel Aviv versus Jerusalem? How many would say Jerusalem has more spiritual influence on a, as a, in a good way in Jerusalem than Tel Aviv? Is Tel Aviv standing for God right now? No. no, it's the most secular place on the face of the earth. And everything that we're looking at in America that's just coming to fruition, it's already been going on in Israel for a while. But in Tel Aviv, because even though it's got its influence in other areas, it doesn't have a spiritual influence anymore. You've got to go to Jerusalem to actually get a spiritual impact. Other cities, yes. But Jerusalem probably has the greatest influence for a Jewish person to go back to the Temple Mount, go back to Jerusalem, and start becoming a part of the Jewish culture again. Yes. A Jew comes back to America with more influence. Because they've been to Israel the place of their forefathers. Now, when you look at this, it says, I became as a Jew, meaning I lived among Judeans, not like I was living in Tel Aviv. In other words, I'm not going to live the way, see, Peter had to live differently among fishermen in the Galilee than when he was in Jerusalem. He was among, around scholars. He had to step it up and say, hey, I know a few things. Well, what do you know? You're a fisherman. No, no, no. I've been following this guy uh, in his way. <laughs> learning his truth, and being a part of his life. His name is Yeshua. Like, who? Did you say Joshua? Yeah, yeah, I said Joshua. Yeshua, same name. Did you just say salvation? Yeah, I said salvation, because in no other name is there found salvation, but in the name that means salvation. Amen. And this influence, watch this, is that I might win Jews, meaning Judeans, those living in Judea, and those who are under the law, this was a term or phrase for a Jew because a Jew was under the Sinai Covenant or the Law of Moses. The Gentiles did not come under that Sinai Covenant. They never said, Nase Benishma to it. Only Israel did. So this is the term that's used among the Pharisees. Someone under the law meant someone who was Jewish. Someone without law or not under the law, it just meant Gentile. It wasn't saying you should or shouldn't keep the law. It was saying you either are Jewish or not, you're a Gentile. That's the term. So he says to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Watch this. To those who are without law, as without law. Who's without law? Gentiles. Gentiles. So in other words, now remember, he can't stop being Jewish, where he said. But maybe he didn't, didn't have to follow all of the restrictions and Jewish customs, per se, to the letter in Tarsus or in another region that's Greek or has a Jew, uh, um, Roman influence the way he would in Jerusalem. He really has to watch everything. He has to cross his T's for Torah, <laughs> dot his I's for Ivrit. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> because he's got to make sure that his influence stays tight. If he's going to have influence with Pharisees, you can't stop being a Pharisee. Right. If he's going to have influence with Greek, he doesn't need to tell them about his Greek education. I mean, his, 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 his Pharisaical education. He needs to use language of Jewish, I mean, of Greek poets. Just like he did in Acts 17. Look what it says in verse um, 22, latter part. It says, 
uh, or 22, it says, To the weak I became as weak. Who is the weak person? The Gentile, Goyim. That I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Watch this. Now this I do for the gospel's sake. Why do I do it? For the gospel's sake, that I might have partaker of it with you. Now, let me give you a, a, a commentary I wrote on this. Saul knew that as a Jew circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew from the Hebrew nation, uh, and a Pharisee of Pharisees, highly trained in the law, or the Torah of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, he had a right to boast or to be confident in the flesh. Although he could boast in his Jewish identity, as a leader in the nation that God had specifically chosen, Paul chose to rather boast as well as worship in the spirit to avoid putting any confidence in the flesh. His unstoppable influence crossed all religious, religious and ethnic boundaries. He would, have, he would have had a commanding control of rabbinical languages like Hebrew, Aramaic, and even what would later be Arabic commentaries. Uh, uh, Jews in Spain had to write in Arabic. And also Greek, like Greek-speaking Jews, and Latin as a Roman citizen. Paul prided himself as, in, uh, as an influential leader that he could remain a Jew to Jews and present also a Greek-style message at the level of his Greek audience that they could understand. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. He stayed true who, who he was because he can't stop being who he is. But that's what caused him to be effective to both communities, Jew and Gentile. Yeah. Yeah. Same with Abraham. He was just as nice to what he thought was some Gentile guests at his tent door as well as to the Jewish ones. The rabbi said that's why he gave them meat and milk to prophets together. <laughs> Wrong story. Let me give you some um, things that I think will um, help you in your influence. And we've done this study before and I thought it would be nice to bring it back. Seven things you've got to be careful of that can interrupt your influence. Number one, being inconsistent. Deviating from a set plan, purpose, or principle that creates reliability. Inconsistency is one of our biggest problems with being influential. The second thing is being insensitive. Thoughtlessly caring, causing hurt, excuse me, sensitivity, uh, being insensitive. Inability to empathize with feelings of others or respond to their needs. It will stop your influence if people discern that you're insensitive. You don't care about them. You don't really take the time to be concerned about what they're going through. Number three, if you're inconsiderate, that will stop your influence because you are thoughtlessly causing hurt or incon in inconvenience to others. That will stop you dead in your tracks if you are inconsiderate. You don't consider other people. The fourth thing that will stop your influence is being indecisive. Difficulty making decisions or staying committed to a previous choice or plan. Yes. So think about it. What if I would have said, oh, six days of morning manna. Now you guys don't even know how hard I work at that morning manna. You just don't know. You have no clue. I stay up to the wee hours of the morning sometimes, putting together the devotional. Yeah. When I ask you if you read it, it's because I put a lot of time and effort into it. It's like a pearl of great price to me. So the beauty of it is, if I were inconsistent or indecisive, I would say the following week, you know, it was too much work. I'm not going to do it anymore. You guys get your own morning manner. I kind of showed you the ropes. Uh, let's not do it. I'm committed to this. Are you? Yeah. Yes. I'm committed to learning as a community of believers. If you can commit, then I'll stay committed. But guess what? My commitment comes first. Because I had to make a decision to do it whether you read it or not. Whether you did it or not. The next thing, number five, that can affect your influence is being intolerant. And this is what's hard today in the world we live in politically. Not tolerant of views, beliefs, and behavior that differ from one's own. You can be tolerant of a person without accepting their beliefs. Number six, ineffective, which means not producing any significant results or desired effects. If you've been doing the same thing day in and day out and you're getting no results, change up. Yeah. You know what I said the other day? I felt like my routine and my workout was getting kind of, you know, ineffective. I wasn't seeing the results like I was seeing in the beginning. And I realized that I need to change my workout because my body gets used to the old pattern. And if you're not getting spiritual, mental, emotional uh, effect in your life, it could be because you're being ineffective because you're not changing things up. True. Number seven, the last one, being irrelevant. Oops. Being irrelevant means 
being disconnected from people or isolated from situations that prevent a leader from affecting change or motivating growth. Remember that influence means I can affect a change. And we want to up, have an effect by an effect. So we want to, we want to be changing lives around us. And the only way we're going to do that is by the three things I want you to fill in today. From this portion, I hope you have learned not only from Moses, but from Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, to be interactive in people's lives. Even when Saul saw the pagan idols in Acts 17, 1, he was disgusted by them. But he held that back and ministered to them. You know what's happening in your, with your friends and your family? They see the anger you have on your face. When they're sinning and messing up and making mistakes, and when you try to minister to them, they see that you're disgusted with them already. So how can you show the love of Yeshua if you're already frustrated with them before you minister to them? You've got to be interactive. Make people your concern and understanding their needs, values, and purposes your focus. Number two, you got to stay involved. Be involved. Find a common ground with the people you desire to influence and choose to see the world from their perspective rather than from your own. It doesn't mean you change your perspective. It means you take a look from a different perspective for a moment to sharpen your edge. Number three, stay interested. Be interested and give each person eye contact. I've been, you know, it's one of the struggles I have. When I give you eye contact, you know, sometimes I give people eye contact, they look away because they're like, oh, he's staring at me, he's looking at me. I'm, oh, I'm trying to say hello. <laughs> And then other times, you know, I'm getting a call, I'm getting a text, I'm looking at my phone, I'm looking at my, my computer, and I, I'm such a busy guy that I have to make sure that I only meet with people when I literally have full, can give you my full attention. So sometimes when you try to catch me on the fly, you're putting both of us as, at a lose-lose situation. Because I want to give you my full attention, but I have to set that aside and go, okay, this meeting is just between you and me, we're going to talk, I'm going to hear you out. Uh, give them your eye contact and your undivided attention as you listen to their heartfelt thoughts concerns, consider what they may be going through. And last, be inspiring as I close. Passionately provide the person you are trying to influence with words that express possibilities that they have yet to obtain and encourage them that you will journey with them while they ask questions and explore new strategies. How many could commit to those four things? Be interactive, be involved, be interested, and be inspiring. If you have those four things, you will have influence and allow the blessings in your life to bless others. Amen. Would you stand to your feet today? Can you give God a hand clap as you receive from this message today? Uh, this week we're going to be looking at how to stand. We're going to look at covenant. We're going to explore the hidden or secret things of the Lord. We're going to learn how to deal with exile. Which even meant being naked sometimes and they'd strip them of all their clothing. What do you do when you've been stripped naked in exile? How about when they persecute you? How are you going to be a witness? And then finally, my message next week is going to be revealed secrets of the Torah. Stretch your hands for the blessing. Number 6, 24 through 26. High priest would stretch out his hands. He would bless the people. Ya era rona pana belecha bihuneka Isatona hai pana belecha vea semlecha shalom amen May the Lord and I bless and keep you shine his face upon you be gracious to you lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace in the name of Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Hashem Yeshua, Yeshua the Anointed Messiah, in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you today.
是。